Bible. We're in a series called Wisdom. We're walking through some of the passages in the book of Proverbs. So I invite you to that right now to, to open your Bible anyways. And today's message, I'm going to be all over the place because I'm going to talk about something everyone does well but doesn't like to take. That's criticism. We critique well. We criticize well. Sometimes in the church, I've been going here 19 years now full time. And sometimes I'm like double checking my Bible just to make sure that criticism isn't listed as a spiritual gift. For some, that's all they want to do is criticize. So today I was like, well, let's go to the book of Proverbs in this series and deal with this very delicate question that's a little awkward in this way. How do you deal with criticism? So let me explain by just sort of starting off by pointing you to a few little uh, thoughts and a story. Uh, ever have that moment... <laughs> When you're talking to someone and they might have like a booger in their nose, they might have something in their beard or something in their teeth, or maybe even worse for those who public speak, you got your fly down or something. Like when I'm preaching sometimes, this is how awesome some people here at Center Point who really love me, they'll write at the top of my page, your fly is down. And uh, ever have those moments when you're like, oh man, like... And, and let's say you see that, right? You see someone and they have something in their teeth. And you have this sort of moment where are you going to give them that feedback? Like, uh, let's just say a guy's at Casimir, he's having breakfast. You look over, he's all dressed up, he has a suit on. You see him, he's in, he's in the corner by the door. You're over in the other corner and he's eating a bagel, drinking his coffee. And you notice from across the room that he's nervously glancing at his watch and then you see him get up and you notice he has cream cheese in his mustache and you're looking from across the room and you notice this and you're like man I, I should really let him know but do do we have that relationship where I can let him know like stop and think with me uh here for a minute what would you do would you go running after the stranger, tell him about the cream cheese? Would you find that would be too awkward to do and hope that somebody else would maybe notice it and tell him first? What if you were that man? Would you want somebody to tell you? Like, ever think about that? Sometimes I'm like, if I had something in my teeth, would I want someone to come up and tell me that? You got to think these things through in life. What do you do when you need to say or hear something that's both hard and that has to be said? So here's what I want you to think about. Uh, hopefully that man would look in a mirror that he'd notice that before he went off to a meeting. Hopefully he does that to save him self from embarrassment, but center point, the harsh reality is this. We all have something on our face. We all have cream cheese on our face. Not one of us in this room is exempt. Not one of us in this room can go, I got life all together. I got it all figured out. In fact, whether we're aware of it or not, there's cream cheese on our face right now. And the reality is those who are close to us probably see it. And if we're going to be in relationship, we need to face these moments, especially if you're in the room uh, and you're in close relationships with friends, with uh, your spouse, etc. In that way, you need to learn to handle, and not only from those closest to you, but from those who maybe don't really know you either, you need to learn how do I handle feedback, how do I handle uh, criticism, and uh, I've been doing, like I said, ministry now for almost 19 years full time, and I could tell you, right out of the gate, I... I <laughs> I have this stuff. I have emails where I've had people write me and say, you should quit. You shouldn't be a pastor. What are you doing? Uh, I would tell you in 19 full years of ministry, I've been criticized more than I've been encouraged. And it's only the call of God that would keep me going. So even in our church culture, we need to be careful because what happens is we have criticism, which all criticism I think is valuable uh, and you got to sort of sort that through in your life. And I want to keep today 
uh, as simple as possible from God's word. And I want to look at three realities that deal with the topic of criticism because it's going to be in your life. There's always going to be someone out there who has something to say, be it close to you or even an enemy, whatever that looks like. So first, here's what we need. Uh, We actually need criticism, okay? So not all criticism is bad. We need criticism. Second, many of us, if not all of us, we're afraid to receive it. And there's multiple reasons as to why we're afraid. And finally, I want to talk about how the cross of Jesus gives us exactly what we need so that we can receive criticism. So let's start with this. We need criticism in our life. This morning, we're going to read a number of Proverbs that talk about this. The Proverbs were actually given to us so that we could learn to live life skillfully. They're written so that we would know how to live life in this world that God has created in wise ways. And one of the greatest themes running through the book of Proverbs is that we need to be open to receiving advice, critique, that we need to be receptive even to correction. It says this in Proverbs 25 verse 12, the wise recognize rebuke as a gift of gold. It is kindness and a token of love. It also says, In Psalm 145, verse 5, let a righteous man strike me. It is a kindness. Let him rebuke me. It is oil for my head. Let my head not refuse it. Often, it is easier for others in our lives not to say anything. Could we agree? It is so much easier to stay quiet, to not critique, to not rebuke, to not correct, because many of us, if we were being honest, we're afraid of confrontation, aren't we? We, we start from this standpoint. I just want people to like me. I want people, if not maybe to love me. So when it comes to this whole thing about, in a way, challenging, critiquing, giving advice into other people in their lives, what we do is we tend to choose people in our life who will say what we want to hear, or when we go to them for advice, they will tell us what we want to hear. And then we merely go down the path of folly and death. But correction, reproof is actually an act of love, a willingness to own the awkward moment, and perhaps having your counsel thrown back in your face for the risk of doing someone good. So when a spouse, a friend, a family member, or an associate rises to the level of such love, we should be so thankful. We should be so thankful that someone loves us enough because here's the reality about ourselves. The person who lies to you the most is yourself. The person who tells you you're awesome, you're great the most is yourself. And many times in life, we have blinders on, and we need people who we love, who love Jesus, who will push us, who will challenge us, who will give us good feedback into our lives. And this is one of the greatest themes running through the book of Proverbs, is this whole act of love in correcting, in critiquing, but doing it in a proper biblical way. Those who embrace rebuke are wise. They walk the path of life, while those who despise reproof find themselves to actually be fools, heading towards death. Here's a bunch of Proverbs I just want to read to you. Proverbs 12, 15. The way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Where there is strife, there is pride, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. Proverbs 13.10. Proverbs 17.10. A rebuke impresses a discerning person more than a hundred lashes a fool. So according to these passages, being teachable. That is so missing in our culture right now. Everybody thinks they know everything. 
And I've even caught myself. Ever meet someone and they do a job that, like, they're like, even if I explain it to you, you won't understand? Ever meet those people? They have that type of job. And they're telling you about their job. And they're like, do you get it? Do you understand? You're like, oh, yeah. I gotcha. And you have no clue. And next time they come around, they try telling you about their job. But your conversation before was, I should know what they're doing. Because last time we talked, I knew it all. Ever have those moments in your life where you think you know everything and we're in this day because we have the internet at our disposal where we're all experts on so many things, but the reality is we're probably not as, ex have as much expertise as we think. And this happens all the time and we're not teachable. Like what I'm realizing, even as a pastor, the more I do this, the more the years build up, the more it is for me to be comfortable in what I've always known and how I've done it so that when I'm taught some new things, I don't just stand there and go, well, who are they? Who do they think they are? I've done this for this long. I have to be so careful in my own life because here's the reality. Life is going on. We're going to, as long as God tarries and allows us to tarry in this world, there's going to be new generations, new ways of doing things that come up. It's going to happen. It's already happening now. And some of us, if we're not careful, we get set in our own ways and we become unteachable. That's so dangerous. Like we should be able to even learn from children. We should be able to learn from those who are older than us, those who are younger than us. We should be able to at least be teachable, to receive at times correction. It's actually a mark of a mature person. The ability to take advice, the ability to be corrected and rebuke is not only considered a mark of the wise, but it's also thought to determine the path of the wise. Like you need people in your life who will challenge you, who will point out things in your life. In fact, scripture tells us that both the wise and the foolish reap consequences according to their ability to take criticism. Again, Proverbs 13.13, 13, whoever scorns instruction will pay for it, but whoever respects a command is rewarded. Proverbs 15.32, those who disregard discipline despise themselves, but those who heed correction gain understanding. The one who rejects reproof leads others astray. That's Proverbs 10.17. Think about that. If you don't receive correction, you will lead other people down that path that you're heading says that they're prudent, Proverbs 15.5. They love knowledge, Proverbs 12.1. They will dwell among the wise, Proverbs 15.31. And is on the path of life, Proverbs 10.17. Because the rod and the reproof give wisdom, Proverbs 29.15. And the reproofs of discipline are the way of life, Proverbs 6.23. To the one who embraces rebuke, here's what God says. I will pour out my spirit to you, Proverbs 1.23. But to the one who despises it, I will laugh laugh at your cal calamity, Proverbs 1, 25 and 26. It will be said of those who reject correction, they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices, Proverbs 1, 30, 31. And it's only a matter of time until themselves they say, I am at the brink of utter ruin, Proverbs 12 to 14. And when ruin comes for the fool who resi resists correction, reproof, it will be sudden and it'll be devastating. Proverbs 29, verse 1. He who is often reproved yet stiffens his neck will suddenly be broken beyond healing. I think one of my favorite Proverbs in all of Scripture is the one found in Proverbs 27, verses 5 and 6. It says this. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. So in this passage... We see that there's such a thing as friendly wounds. And in a sense, there's such a thing as wounding kisses. If you have a trustworthy friend who does this, that's good. Because those bruises are for your good. The bruises represent painful, plain words 
that must be spoken in true friendship. Uh, I love these people in my life. They'll be able to challenge you and you walk away and go, oh, that was so good. I needed those words because they love Jesus. They love you. They want the best for you. I've also been on the flip side, and we'll get more into that, where someone who doesn't even know you will show up and criticize you, and you're like, who are you? What's your name? Uh, you'll have those situations in life as well. Those bruises, though, from a friend are redemptive. They love you enough to tell you the truth about yourself, and here's the thing about love that we miss in our, in our society. Love and correction actually go together. We think love without challenge, love without correction. But what we need in our culture is love with correction, love with challenge. We need that so much. We need to actually hear God's voice in our brothers and our sisters in the Lord. All of us who have in Jesus... We have this, all the treasure of wisdom and knowledge. That's Colossians 2.3. And right now, here's the reality, Proverbs 19.20, listen to advice, accept instruction that we may gain wisdom in the future. So these people come in, Jesus allows them to come in and speak into our lives. And we'll not just put up with someone speaking into our lives if we get this, but we'll actually invite people to do so. Uh, I have a couple of close friends, and I've opened up to them, and I said, here's my tendencies. If you see this in my life, call me out. Challenge me. Talk to me about it. Because the reality is, if you don't invite others in, you won't really be known. Not all of us got it together, right? Not one person here, not one person in the world can go, look at me, I figured it all out. So we need people who would speak into our lives, even when it's a rebuke that's poorly delivered, even when the timing's off and the tone is off and the motivation seems maybe suspect, uh, suspect uh, we'll want to uh, look at it and we'll want to sort of, I'll say, dive into it so much that we'll tear it apart and we'll get upset at the person, the individual, when what we need to do is we need to take it. Uh, I remember being in, in Bible college and it was our junior year. And I shared this story a while, uh, quite a while ago, but we were having a play and I auditioned for the main role of the play and I thought, like, I nailed it. I did this so well. I should get the main part. I had no fears, no worries. And then the next day they put up the list of the part you got and I didn't get the main part and I kept looking for my name and I finally found my name. It was under demon number three. And I'll never forget that because I was like, this is so wrong. I'm better than a demon. I would have nailed that main part. I could have been the main guy in the play. And I remember complaining to a, a, a group at Bible College who I was sort of hanging around with. And uh, I remember the girl, her name was Renee, and she looked at me and she said, would you just shut up? You're so prideful. Just play demon number three. And do it for Jesus. And she walked away. <laughs> And I was like, at first I'm like, who do you think you are? Because you weren't at my edition. I was really good. And if you read my personality trait, it says I should be an actor. They're right. And I'm thinking all this crazy stuff. And finally, I go back to my room, and I'm praying, and I'm reading scripture, and the Spirit of God convicts me. And, and the Spirit of God put on my heart, tomorrow you need to thank Renee. Because, Howie, you're an idiot. And I went to Renee, and I was, like, smiling. I'm like, thank you so much. Yesterday when you said, like, you're so prideful and you're an idiot, uh, thank you for that. And she sort of was throwing off. And I was like, no, I, I really needed that, so thank you. In fact, I'm going to be the best demon that I can be for the glory of Jesus <laughs> in a play. See, when a brother or a sister in Christ goes to the inconvenience to have unpleasant conversations or statements towards you or correction in your life, you should be actually floored with thanksgiving. You should be so thankful that someone cares about you enough 
to speak into your life. Let the, here's what it says. The Lord reproves him whom he loves, Proverbs 3.12. The Lord corrects those he loves. Count it as love from your brother, as love from your sister, as God's channel of his love for you. Like, see that. See that when your brother and sister in the Lord come to you to talk to you, to challenge you, to criticize you. Take that as a channel of God's love towards you. But on the other hand, an enemy may sweet talk you. He may say nothing but good to you, but fail to tell you that you actually have a blob of cream cheese on your face. And here's the reality. They don't love you enough to tell you the truth. And we tend to talk to people who will never tell us we have a blob of cream cheese on our face. We tend to talk to people who don't criticize us, who don't challenge us, who don't spur us on to growth in Christ-likeness. The scripture is clear. We need criticism. We need input. We need feedback. Every single one of us needs loving correction. Every one of us needs loving rebuke. It's a mark of actually true friendship. It's a mark of true friendship. I love how Paul Tripp puts it. We must remember that sin is deceitful. Sin blinds. And guess who gets blinded first? Me. I have no trouble seeing the sins of my family. Can we just be honest? We have no trouble seeing the sins of other people. You're a room full of sinners. Can we own that? Like, we have no trouble seeing it. We look at people all the time, and we are like, I'm so glad I'm not like them. We might not say that, but we've thought it. We've thought, oh, I am so much better, or I, I have my life together, and theirs is falling apart. And we look, and we see the sins of others. But I can be astonished when mine are pointed out. My self-perception is as accurate as a carnival mirror. Center point. Many times we don't see our own mess. This is a universal need. If you don't have people in your life who are telling you the truth, and if you aren't humble enough to receive the truth, then you're missing out on something that is critical actually for your well-being. Not only that, but if you are not doing the same for your friends, then you aren't really a true friend. So in your close relationships, lovingly challenge each other, lovingly push each other closer to Jesus. Correction is absolutely necessary for wise living, and it's actually a mark of true friendship. So encourage others to speak truth into your life. Like, invite that as you get to know people. Say, I need your caring eyes on my soul. I need your help. Where do you see cream cheese on my face? I invite you in. Let me know. Charles Spurgeon said, get a friend to tell you your faults are better still. Welcome an enemy who will watch you keenly, because they do, and sting you savagely. What a blessing. Such an irritating critic will be for a wise person. We need criticism. But then we need to see point number two. We're actually afraid to receive it. So we need it, but we're terrified to receive it. You'll notice that the Proverbs all assume a reality. We are hesitant to receive advice. We are all suffer. We all suffer from a fatal condition. It's called Pride. That's why we're terrified to receive critique. It's pride. Pride is thinking more highly of yourself or things about yourself than you should. It's a posture that stands in opposition to Jesus. Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus calls all who follow him to carry their crosses, which includes putting to death our exaggerated false sense of self-importance. And in the church, man, I'll go first. Pastors are guilty of this. They take their label as a pastor and they flaunt it. 
They, they can become so prideful, but yet even in our church circle, no matter what we do, no matter how we serve, if we're not careful, we become prideful. We can be talented musicians, singers, speakers, serving, and we can become so prideful that in our pride, we're actually hurting ourselves. In our pride, we're actually putting up a wall that we're not inviting others in to speak into our life. There are all kinds of Proverbs that get to the heart of this, like this one, Proverbs 15, 31 to 33. Whoever heeds life-giving correction will be at home among the wise. Those who disregard discipline despise themselves, but those who heed correction gain understanding. Wisdom's instruction is to fear the Lord, and humility comes before honor. This passage says that if we welcome life-giving correction, we will be at home among the wise. If that's the case, why in the world aren't we looking for correction in our life? If that means I'm going to be among the wise, why do I not look for it? And here's what happens. This basically is telling us in Proverbs that we're not cultivating humility. The problem is that we're often unwilling to admit our mistakes. We're prone to reject criticism. The problem when you get right down to it is pride. And pride, center point, is deadly. Proverbs 26, 12 says, Do you see people who are wise in their own eyes? There is more hope for fools than for them. Definition of humility. Humility is honestly assessing ourselves in light of God's holiness and our sinfulness. You only compare yourself to one person. That's Jesus. He's holy. You're a mess. Filled with sin. And by the grace of God, Jesus saves us from the sin. But we still battle with the sin. See, to be humble, we really need to understand God in his holiness. We need to understand ourselves in our sinfulness. The opposite of this is this thing called pride. We have exalted sense of ourselves. We're interested in our own self-satisfaction, self-justification, self-protection, self-exaltation. We've already seen that we all need criticism. The problem is that good criticism dethrones us from our pride and puts us in our rightful place. Every part of you will fight against this when you get right down to it. We're talking about this whole big idol of self. Man, do we ever love ourselves. The person you love the most is you. You got up today. You took care of you, right? Many of us, for the most part. I'm, in junior high, I didn't really do this, but once I got out of that phase, like I shower and I do my hair and I put on deodorant because why? We love ourselves. We take care of ourselves. So the reality is that can be an idol if we're not careful, the idol of self. Do you recognize the idol of self? There is deep-rooted desire to place ourselves our reputation, our honor above all else. Do you see this controlling desire that you have for self-justification to be proven right or righteous in the eyes of others? Unfortunately, our idols always have consequences. And if we persist in idolatry, it'll lead to our ruin. This is where even unfair criticism can actually be tremendously helpful to you. Because unfair criticism will reveal whether we're on the throne or whether God is. This is so helpful to us. We resist criticism because criticism threatens to dethrone us. We don't want to be off the throne. But the reality of the gospel is we're already off the throne. Jesus has the throne. This is the last thing. The cross gives us exactly what we need to receive criticism. So follow me on this. However, as much as receiving this correction goes against our instincts or catches us off our gospel guard in the moment, we have this great hope to grow into. Here it is. The love of Jesus for us is actually the skeleton key that's able to unlock for us the power of 
rebuke. When I get the gospel, rebuke, challenging criticism is actually welcomed with him in view, Jesus, who loved me, who gave himself for me. See, no longer must criticism or reproof be an assault on our very foundations, our deep sense of worth, but it becomes a fresh opportunity for growth. It becomes an opportunity for greater joy. It is another grace of the gospel that by the Spirit, we can actually grow a thick skin. We have too many people who just don't have a thick skin. We get offended over everything everything. Someone's always offended over something. And if we're not careful and we don't have a thick skin, we'll take personal offense to so many things. I've had people upset at me, and this is because I grew up in Eastern BI, but I've driven by people and I didn't wave. But I didn't see the person. But this is how we are in our culture. It's like, they must not like me. And then all of a sudden, they head to this whole story that they create in their minds. They didn't wave to me. They didn't say hi to me. They didn't acknowledge me. What did I do to them? Why are they offended? Why are they against me? And this is the culture we live in. We don't have a thick skin. So when someone comes to us to correct us, to criticize us, even if the criticism isn't valid, we get all up because we don't know how to take criticism. We don't know how to take a rebuke. We don't know how to be corrected. This is our day and age. All we got to look at is even in how we were brought up. There are generations that were brought up different in this as well with correction, etc. And this is the culture we find ourselves in. If we were being honest, we're a bunch of snowflakes many times. We are. We don't know how to handle negative feedback. We don't know how to handle the person who is critiquing us, criticizing us. And what we really need is a thick skin to hear a reproof as a pathway to even more grace. If I get the gospel, I get this. Only in Jesus can we find our identity. That's the only place we can find our identity. And in being shown love by God while we were still sinners, we had a ton of faults. Romans 5.8. And with this Savior... He comes, he dies for us, that while we're still sinners, he loves us. And here's the thing about the gospel, about the cross. It rebukes us more than any person ever will. The cross shows us we have fallen short. The cross shows us we are so sinful. We are so messed up. Ultimately, it's the cross that gives us everything that we need to receive criticism. So how should we as Christians respond to criticism? And I want to talk about this because I think there are three ways you can respond to criticism. First one is this. Remember who you are. Remember who you are. Much of our anxiety, many of our insecurities, at least some of our fear in this life can be dealt with if we're able to truly remember who we are or maybe even better to remember whose we are. Remember who you are in Christ. That's your identity. That's your foundation. So when people come and critique you and criticize you, your identity is on a solid foundation. It's found in Christ. So someone could say anything to you and it's not going to alter you because you know who you are. You know whose you are. He holds you. You're in his family. You're in his body. So when someone comes to you and they say, I think you're acting foolish, you go, I know I act foolish so much. Because you know you've fallen short. But it's the grace of God that holds you through the gospel of Jesus Christ. You need to see this. Our position in this family of the church is secure. We no longer have to manage our reputations. We no longer have to prove ourselves. We no longer have to justify our existence. We can live in a state of humble confidence, knowing that we are fully accepted fully beloved as children of God, without this knowledge, criticism, especially from someone we know, someone we trust, can actually be crushing. But because we get the gospel, we can hold to it. We can live from it, assured of who we are. See, the things we battle with in, 
in our own personal lives, let's just be real, let's throw it on the table. It's our worth, it's our value, it's our significance, it's our purpose. And some of us, our worth, our significance is put into what other people think of us. So if people think you're good, people think you're awesome, then you feel significant. It's put into your jobs, maybe into what's your last name and what's the family reputation. And a lot of us find our value and worth in stuff like this, what we own, how much money we have, uh, what type of car we drive, what house do we live in. All of that can be attached to our value, our worth. But if you're found in Jesus, oh, you're worthy. Not because of who you are, but because of who he is and who he's made you to be. You're significant. I, I remember uh, last fall I had someone basically uh, take counseling notes that, that were me opening up my life. And I, and I struggled with significance. I've never been afraid to share this in my life. And a lot of it's attached to the way I even was growing up and the way I thought of it. And if I performed well, then people would like me. So that's why as I pursued sports and I did well, I felt significant because if I got an award, if I got a medal, I was like, yes, someone's going to be proud of me. They're going to accept me. They're going to give me significance. And that can all lead into the way you live your life. And I had someone go, you know what, Howie, your problem is your significance is in Centerpoint Church. And I went, well, that's a good statement to make, but can I share with you my journey? That if you said that in 2014, you were probably right. But let me tell you, God has worked on my heart. And this is the thing about sanctification and Christlikeness. I no longer struggle with my significance being in what I do as a pastor. But my significance is in the person. I looked at this guy who was bringing this up. And I said to him, just ask me right now, Howie, where do you find your significance? And he wouldn't ask me. And I said, well, I'll, I'll ask myself. Howie, where do you find your significance? My significance is in my Savior, Jesus, who has made me a child of God and who has freed me from finding my significance in other people. See, that's the gospel. That's the power of the gospel. We're always growing into this center point. Some of you, you struggle with your worth because you're looking at what the world says you should be. So we go, this is where the idol of self comes in. So, so this is in every area. So we go, maybe I need to be thinner then I'll be accepted. Maybe I need more muscles, and then I'll be accepted. Maybe I need to drive that car, or maybe I need to have that house, and maybe I need to get married, and, and then we're robbed of our, our time as a single. Like, isn't, isn't, it a, let's, isn't it a gift in our singleness? Like, I, I often think about that. Like, when you're single, you, like, you have all that time to give to the glory of God to serve him. And, and in our church, we don't really value those who are single. It's always like, hey, when are you getting married? Hey, hey, what's going on? Who's in your life? No, take this time. If you're single, serve God for his glory. Uh, and I'd always say this, like the reality is there's going to be families. They're going to take time. They're going to take time to grow, develop. And we in our churches put our, we, we almost make it look like singles need to be married to have significance. They don't. They're, they need Jesus like everyone else. Our significance, our worth, our value is in Christ. The second thing I want us to do after remembering who we are, and this is how you can receive criticism, is consider where you're headed. Okay? Consider where you're headed. Armed with the knowledge and confidence of who we are, we can actually deal objectively with the criticism. So if you're here today and you're found in Jesus, where are you heading? Someone, please interact with me. Where are you going? It's not hard. Heaven, heaven thank you. Like, you are headed to heaven. Not only that, right now in this world, you are headed to Christ's likeness. Isn't that awesome? Where are you headed? You are headed on a personal growth to be like Jesus. Someday in heaven, it will be complete. But where are you headed? You're headed to heaven. We need to realize and consider where we're headed. It's to heaven, towards Christ-likeness. We are being formed by the Spirit of God into holy people, both inside and out. Not only that, but as Christians, we are also moving towards this thing I like to call excellence. Not perfection, excellence. Whatever God has given you, do it with what? Excellence. 
serve with excellence. If you can play the guitar, play the guitar with excellence. If you can preach, speak, do it with excellence. If you can serve kids and bless kids, do it with excellence. If you can give and help others, do it with excellence. Do it all with excellence for the glory of God. Not perfection, excellence. Sometimes I wake up on Sunday and I'm so tempted just to do what I've always done because I know how to preach, but I'm trying to go, all right, I need the Spirit of God. I need Him to empower me, and I need to serve and do it with excellence. So during the week, I need to study. I need to know Scripture so that when I come here and I proclaim it, I don't waste your time. I want you to serve Jesus with excellence in whatever that is, in how you serve Him. Do it all for His glory in excellence. And then I want you to think about the source of criticism. Only after you remember who you are and after you remember where you're headed. Uh, what we tend to do is dismiss it right away. Do that at the last. Hear me. Even your worst enemy who criticizes you, they might accurately say something that you need to deal with. But if you know who you are, if you know where you're headed, you can even take their criticism and go, oh, they have a point. I need to learn from that. I need to grow from that. There are all important questions that we need to ask ourselves. And at the same time, we might look at someone and go, man, they criticize me over everything. Know where your criticism is coming from. There are people who just don't like you. Welcome to the world. Some of you are like, oh, Howie, everyone loves me. No, they don't. <laughs> there is someone in your life who is, like I mentioned before, keenly watching you. Like, I'm at Superstore even this week, and I've had someone come up to me and go, I know who you are. And I didn't even know them. And I'm like, oh, what do you know? <laughs> like, do you, do you realize people are keenly watching you? They're aware you know those people, you have those people in your life. And here's the thing, we should be welcome to the truth of criticism before dismissing it. So criticism will come. Instead of being crushed, we ask, who, who am I? Where am I going? And where is this criticism coming from? There are people who will just criticize you no matter what. You don't have to take all of that criticism. You don't have to believe all of that criticism. What Paul does now in the New Testament, he basically tells us that the gospel gives us everything we need to accept criticism. So Romans 8, 31 to 34, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Get this, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Any charge. It is God who justifies. Who then can condemn? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, he, and we started off the service today with declaring this, he is at the right hand of God, and he is also interceding for us. Jesus right now is on a throne, reigning, ruling, and he's praying for you. He's got you. He's holding you. He knows what's in store for you. And here's the beautiful thing about the cross. The cross confirms and affirms God's judgment of us. There is no escaping the truth. As God's word says, there is no one righteous, not even one. As a result of my sin, the cross has, has judged me more intensely, more deeply, and truly more than any person ever could. In other words, no one else's criticism of me could match the thir the, how thorough God is at the cross of his criticism of me, knowing this, we can respond to all criticism by saying, that's just a fraction. Someone got something on you, you just go, oh, there's so much more. You have time? You wanna hear 
how else I mess up? You want to hear where else I fall short? And you can hear all of it. We'll talk about it. We'll share it. But then I'm coming to Jesus. And here's who Jesus is. Jesus is the Savior. Where I fall short, he bridges the gap. Jesus is the Savior who I come to with my mess, and he cleans up my mess. That's my Savior. That's my Jesus. Oh, I am so flawed. I am so marred in dirt. I am so ugly. I am so filthy. But Jesus, he's made me beautiful. Jesus, he has cleansed my heart. Jesus, he has freed my soul. My Savior, it says in the Bible that his blood has covered my sin and I am white as snow. I am pure before my mighty, beautiful, wonderful Savior because of his work, what he's done. Oh, I am messed up. I am flawed. It, I could keep you all day to tell you about my imperfections, where I fall short. But, but let's go to the, the cross. Let's go to the cross. Because on the cross, Jesus died for my pride. On the cross, Jesus died for my addictions. On, on the cross, Jesus died for my testimony where I didn't honor him or serve him in ways that I should have. Jesus died even when I serve him in my pride. He died for that on the cross. Jesus carried all my sin on the cross. He was buried, but hear me, the gospel is he was raised again. He conquered sin. He conquered death. He conquered Satan. And then he empowers me to live in the power of the Spirit because he endured dwells me with the Holy Spirit and the book of 2 Peter tells me that I have everything I need now to live in righteousness. I don't need anything else. I have everything. It's the Holy Spirit. He empowers me. He, he's the one who fills me. He's the one who leads me. And I have that right now in this life, in this world. And there is coming a day and we always forget to take the gospel to its conclusion. But there's going to be the day Jesus comes again and he's going to bring me home. I'm going to reign with him. I'm going to serve with him. I'm going to walk with him in perfect holiness. There is no sin on me. There is no dirt on me because he has made me whole. That's the gospel. My savior, he will return. He will, he will usher in his kingdom. And some of us, we need this today because you sit here and you feel dirty. You feel filthy. You feel like a failure. Hear me. Jesus cleans you up. It's the only answer I have. It's the only answer I have to tell you. How do you get free of addiction? You got to know Jesus more. You got to know him as your savior. You got to walk with him. And here's what you find. As you walk with Jesus, oh, it's so beautiful. When you walk with Jesus, that relationship is so good. Like, like you just go, at any time, I can talk to him. At any time, I can praise him. At any time, I can speak the fears of my heart to him. And he does not push me away. He brings me in closer. That is my Savior. That is my Jesus. I can take all criticism because on the cross, Jesus took it all off of me and put it on him. That's the gospel. That's what you need. That's what you've been looking for, for your worth, for your significance, for your value, for your purpose. It is only found in a person. His name is Jesus. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you. As messed up as we are, you loved us. The while we were still, still sinners, you sent your son Jesus, and Jesus, you died on the cross for us. Like, that, that should just blow our minds. You left heaven. 
You came to earth. You lived the life that, you, that, that I couldn't live, that no one in this room could ever live, no one watching online could ever live. You died. You carried sin. You took it for us. Today, all I can do is praise All I can do is say, here I am, Jesus. Take everything. I pray if there's a person in the room who does not know you watching online, we'll watch this this week or later on. I pray that right now in this moment, your Holy Spirit sets them free of sin. I pray that they would confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus, that they will believe in their hearts that God raised him from the dead. And in doing so, he conquered sin. He conquered death. He conquered Satan. And in doing that, we now have this freedom. Like those of us who are found in Jesus right now, we are free. We are set free. There is no dirt. There is no filth on us. And even though people can criticize us and point things out, we welcome it. We see it. And we want to be more like you, Jesus. Let that heart resonate. I just want to be like Jesus. I want to walk with him. I want to love him. I want to serve him. I want to tell others about him. And I will not rest until family, friends, co-workers, the world hears that there's hope, that the world hears. We have so many people right now taking their lives, committing suicide, drug overdoses everywhere. And what they need to hear is you have value. You have worth. You have purpose. You are loved more than you could ever imagine. You don't have to take your life. You don't have to go to the extremes of thinking that if you didn't exist, this world would be better. The reality is God created you. He loves you. He has a plan for you. He has purpose for you. He he wants to use you to impact the world, not for your glory, but for his glory. So Jesus, take everything we have, everything we are, and let us just, let us just put it on you and let you be exalted. Let you get the glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.